Good morning. It is my great pleasure to welcome you on my own behalf. I wish we had a more direct communication, but unfortunately the present day conditions do not allow us any other format. But actually we speak about children's and young people's safety on the internet. So today I want uh, to speak to you about the specific generation, Z generation or I gene generation. And uh, I uh, want you to have a look and see what is the difference between this generation and previous generations. Does it make sense to call them any specific name, any specific generation? If you are in touch with marketing people, you will know that none marketing activity won't start without the creation of a persona. So here we have two personas, uh, persons, Zosia and Kacper. Those two young kids, say 10, 11 years old, start living uh, in the internet. Uh, they are present in this world. In spite of various formal bans, they have their accounts on social media. They actively tap services that have have been prepared by large corporations and are the normal users of life online. And Zosia and Kansper say, go to the same school. Zosia and Kasper are here. And one day, Zosia comes to school wearing this blouse and Kasper meets her. And this is like a usual online, offline meeting. Kasper is quite a naughty young boy. And he says, Zosia, you are a, fi a fat pig. You look like a piglet. What will Zosia do in this difficult uh, situation? Zosia may punch Kacper to keep him shut. Dramatic as it may be, and we know that violence is not a way, but with her emotions this would be understandable. Zosia can also burst into tears, or run away, or start yelling at Kacper. Difficult uh, to imagine that she's not going to react to what, uh, to what has happened. And let us now imagine that we transfer the situation uh, to the online world. So. So um, Zosia post, uh, or puts uh, her picture and Kasper uh, writes uh, to Zosia on her profile, Zosia, you are a fat pig, a swine. And what will happen? For some time, there will be uh, not uh, anything uh, to be seen. Then a private message will arrive at Kacper, and his colleagues will scold him. Oh, that was a really tough go at, Gosh, at, at Zosia. And unless he is uh, absolutely socially immune, he will realize that you don't do such things as he has done to Zosia. And uh, if he is not sensitized, he will never learn a lesson. And this is one of the function, uh, crucial problems in functioning online. Lack of feedback, immediate feedback, immediate feedback. And let us imagine that we have those two personas immersed in this world without the actual real-time feedback about their conduct. Can it produce such a generation? Let's see, the lady uh, that you can see on the picture is Jean Twenge. Uh, she's one of the famous researchers into generational changes in the US. She published her book, iGen, uh, uh, and this has been also published in the Polish language version bearing the same title. Why today's super connected kids are growing up less uh, rebellious, more tolerant, less happy, and completely unprepared for adulthood. So let's have a look at this. Uh, uh, 
journalist comment. If you have been living long enough in the world, you have seen various generations. In Poland, we said we had JP2 generations. So the young people who were formatively growing under the pontificate of John Paul II, the nothing generation that was raising in Poland, that was growing up in Poland in the late 1990s without values. And this was rather a journalist's description, not a genuine sociological and psychological phenomenon. If we look at the history of the 20th and 21st century, we can see that there were certain distinct generations like baby boomers, so the um, uh, generation of the demographic boom. We also say uh, about the PRL, um, People's Republic of Poland generation, who only experienced uh, communist Poland and IGIN. What should IGIN stand for? people born after 1995, so they cannot recall times without the internet, without access to smartphone. They were born with a smartphone in hand, so the world provides them with laptops, tablets, a two-year-old baby moves on a tablet screen with great confidence and literacy in a way. And what kind of people they are? Here you have a questionnaire, a survey that will allow you to define uh, whether you are an hygiene generation or not. In the last 24 hours, have you spent one hour texting, texting people, not only sending text messages uh, per se, but also using uh, communication. Are you available on Snapchat? Yes, you are an hygiene. Are you religious? If so, you are not an hygiene because religiousness is declining very distinctly. Do you think that the same-sex marriages should be legal? Yes, you are an hygiene. Uh, have you spent uh, on a high scale every weekend with friends? Uh, you, if so, you uh, are not an hygiene because hygienes do not meet up that frequently. If we were to summarize certain distinct features describing hygienes, what makes them distinct is uh, immaturity. So, Neotani, uh, so uh, postponement of maturing in a way. So more and more people are bambocione, uh, the Italian men, 35 years old, who enjoy living with their moms in the same household, and they don't want to face the hardships of real life. Also, hygienes are internet preoccupied, the gigantic share of their time is spent in front of various screens. They are more virtual. They do not favor peer-to-peer uh, -peer contacts outside in the real world. Now and then they meet up, but they will uh, uh, get in touch uh, by texting, by sending messages. They are less at ease. They are instable. They have by far more problems with their psychological life, uh, less religious, more isolated, uh, very focused on their own safety, not civically active, not certain of their regular income. There will be a dedicated meeting with Wojciech Holinski for you in this vein, but in general, uh, contemporary young people are not sure whether they would be able to have have the same material security as their parents. This is not obvious uh, to them. They uh, see no restrictions, less uh, um, restrictions concerning sex life, sexual life, or uh, new attitudes towards children. They are inclusive, they approve of diversity, they expect equality, freedom of uh, speech, and they are independent also in their political views, although this independence may be differently understood. In most recent elections, 
I genes were very much in favor of Donald Trump, seeing that Donald Trump is extremely independent of the American establishment per se. If we were to look at the structure of time that is spent uh, um, uh, in front of a screen, well, smartphone will be the most popular device. What do they do? This is the breakdown of the time they spend online, if they are IG. Uh, this is a typical day. The typical day will be like two, point, uh, two hours, 15 minutes for texting, uh, two hours of surfing, uh, searching the internet for various contents, such as BuzzFeed, YouTube, or scrolling uh, uh, social media, one uh, and a half of hour in, of gaming, gaming, which is uh, like a bimodal distribution, so, I would say that some teenagers spend hours and hours gaming, some others do not anything of the kind. 75% of young people uh, are involved uh, in some in playing some games on a mobile. One uh, point 0.5, uh, so half an hour is various video chats. So all in all, six hours per day in new media. This is not a online time, and this is uh, um, like uh, a dedicated slot, six hours for living online. No, no. Uh, the first physical uh, object that you take into your hand as you wake up is uh, your mobile. And this is also the last thing that you put aside if you go to sleep so and fall asleep. So full day, full conscious day uh, of their existence is the online existence. So what do they sacrifice? Well, they don't read books that much. Uh, elect uh, electronic readers was just a, a ray of hope that uh, young people would read more, but they don't. They don't. They limit their interests in reading. They only read obligatory reading for school. School, they also don't read magazines. The magazine market has changed. If we want to read a magazine, we download them or we subscribe to them online. So how should we blame uh, young people that they don't spend money on paper, magazines, news, uh, newspapers, um, and they uh, learn and study less SAT, so the uh, equivalent of a Polish GC uh, shows that they uh, don't study that much. They don't go out much either. They don't see t uh, watch TV that often. They sleep less and they limit their phys uh, social life in general, but they don't sleep that much, which is, of course, bad. I'm not a, a, a doctor, medical doctor myself, but this leads to a serious, serious crisis crisis in uh, uh, their mental health. So what are the basic risk, uh, factors that make you feel unhappy? You see that sports and exercise is uh, like a buffer, as well as going to the church, contact with uh, printed press, and your social life. And then we slide into the regions that uh, enhance our sense of being unhappy, video chats, gaming, texting, social media and internet extensively met. So what uh, uh, fends off the risk of feeling unhappy? Sport, physical exercise. And what increases the risk of feeling unhappy? Well, the internet, the internet and various electronic media. Let me pause for a while. Why sports and exercise would feature so importantly? Why going to church would feature so importantly in keeping you happy? There are two reasons why you can feel more happy. In the first place, any doctor will tell you 
that uh, any physical exercise will increase uh, the production of uh, happiness hormones. Uh, I may not look uh, as a pe person who is jogging, but I do jog, I do run, and in spite of my obvious of, of being overweight, I manage to run like five kilometers a day, which is not a great burden. Moreover, if you exercise, uh, uh, if you um, go into sports, uh, you do it in a team. So this makes you feel happy. This is very much uh, similar to going to church. In the United States, going to church is very much related to the sense of belonging, the sense of community. You are part of a community and this helps you to go through the ups and downs of your uh, puberty and uh, the risks of suicide. Again, very much the same breakdown. People who exercise, who go in for sports, uh, 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 show much lesser risk of committing suicide. Size. And those who are uh, electronically dependent on devices, on the internet, who are addicted to social media, well, the risk of committing suicide is higher for such people. Let me digress in at this point. Would you not uh, draw too far-reaching conclusions on individual persons from this general presentation? If you see children and young people who use a lot of the internet, may, maybe too, uh, too long they are online, and uh, this should not lead you to the immediate conclusion that the risk of a suicide uh, is very high for this particular individual. The person you see on the slide is Professor Maciej Pilecki. He is the head of the chair of psychiatry at the Medical University in Krakow. He works uh, with young people and children, and he specializes in mental problems and mental illnesses. We know that the mental condition of young people is, has been a focus of attention, and he says, for several years now, the number of all mental problems observed in children and young people, not just suicide attempts increases, but also self-harm, anxiety, nutritional problems or distortions, depression and addictions. So we know that I gen generation has all these problems, but somehow we are not able to show, help them. All the information and data that I have presented to you were predated 2020, and it did not take into account this very, very special period that started in May 2020, and that is namely the pandemic and lockdowns. And if we see this uh, diagram, we see that the number of suicidal attempts or suicide attempts in, uh, for young people increased greatly from 348 back in 2013 up to 905, that's almost threefold in 2019. But then pandemic started. So this very strange story of feeling very much in danger and then a prolonged sort of crawling state of emergency and now we're not really sure what it is anymore and we can say that in 2020 the number of suicides and suicide attempts dropped by almost 10 percent so uh, let me present through th three theories as to why that happened i discussed this yesterday with one of the most uh, pronounced specialists in suicide mr madam professor Zhukovska. And we agreed that th these theories might, but just might, explain. So why this number dropped? So these are three theories, and they are not all necessarily mutually excluding. So one thesis is that it is neutral because it is an evolutionary issue. When there is an external threat, usually number of attempts to kill yourself drops. During wars, for example, uh, suicide numbers drops. I mean, Durheim wrote about this uh, pertaining to the Second World War. But uh, in 2018, in Sri Lanka, 
researchers showed that in those parts of Sri Lanka where there was war underway, number of suicides dropped. So from an evolutionary point of view, our body switches into a survival mode and it is less inclined to make a suicide attempt. Did we have a similar situation in 2020? To some extent, yes. And um, this suicidal mode resulted in young people being less inclined to make suicide attempts. We observe a similar tendency also in a grown-up situation, in adult population. And then there is a positive theory. Let us note that in 2020 there was more physical closeness between parents and children. Parents and children were forced to stay in the same space. It created some problems, but generally speaking, made parents more alert. Uh, psychologists, uh, uh, teachers said, be careful, watch your children, make sure that there are no symptoms that would indicate that children find it very difficult to cope with the pandemic conditions. And maybe, just maybe, this worked. This greater accessibility of parents, greater presence of parents in young people's lives. And it was pr also um, inev inevitable because we were all sitting at home. And this all resulted in fewer suicide attempts. And there is another theory that is very sad. I would like for it to be untrue. So it's negative. The very fact that children did not go to school limited the number of negative impulses uh, um, connected with interacting with your peer group and uh, trying to compare yourself to others. And uh, this may have resulted in a smaller number of suicides. As you can see, they are not mutually excluding, and they may help us to explain what happened in 2020. We are still waiting for data for 2021. We uh, will see whether this trend continues. We hope it does. Ladies and gentlemen, I do not have to explain to you that it is difficult for us to count on the um, healthcare sector when it comes to a psychiatry for children and young people. I come from a region when there is not even one clinic or surgery or hospital with a specialized psychiatric ward. So we do not have this network of support for young people who cannot cope. We could ask ourselves, we talk a lot about social media, we often say that social media can be related with the risk of feeling unhappy and also with attempting to commit suicide. Maybe this is just a correlation, so there is no influence. It may be so that people who have some inclinations to feel unhappy for some reason feel unhappy anyway and they are more inclined to immerse in social media because they have no alternative. But this is not true. A Morten Tornholt research from one of the Danish universities shows that when young people are encouraged to take a break, to take a holiday from Facebook, they felt happier, and this was noticeable, so it was enough for them to stop using Facebook for a week. And uh, the well-being factors improved, and they felt happier. So it is not just a coloration, there is influence. So why Facebook and social media can actually make people feel more depressed? First of all, because Facebook is the place where we compare ourselves to others. Even from my experience, when I see profiles of my friends and uh, peers, I can see that they have nothing but success in their life. They get prestigious grants, uh, they publish in very prestigious magazines and papers. They have just published an excellent book. And this has to lead to a situation when I feel envious and also to a situation when I feel there is something wrong with me. And now you can multiply this. You may 
uh, try to put yourself in the shoes of a young person who has no self-assurance and sometimes has no distance to what is presented online. That online life is not the only thing that we have in life, that there are failures apart from success that we present. And then again, there are problems connected with inequality between genders. Girls are more inclined to suffer. Um, their self-assessment, their self-evaluation is um, a big more of a problem. And when girls are 13 to 15, these scissors of self-assessment uh, open very wide. And uh, we see that people are very strongly impacted by information they receive online, especially if they are evaluated or perceived by um, their peers. Padma, a researcher, said when your messages are ignored, you start to think, why do I even exist? So young people are very uh, consider what is being told about them and whether they are being discussed on the internet is very important. Young people also use this for their own purpose. Padma writes, I love this moment when I'm really upset with someone and this person sees that I've read his message and I still ignore him. So young people can manipulate very well. And why do they not reject it? Um, social media destroy our life, young people often say. So the question is, why don't you give up? Because then we would have no life at all. So what has to be done? And I would like to conclude my presentation with a number of recommendations. You can see a tweet by Reuters. Uh, and uh, Reuters informs that China introduced new rules that limit the amount of time children can spend on video games and online. So there is a certain safeguard. If you play for more than three hours per week, uh, this is blocked. It is a way, it is a very strict, very precise, and probably very effective, but the question is, is this really the best thing we can do? Let me quote, quote someone better, not necessarily Chinese authorities. This counterfact, this picture, uh, shows you Philippus Aureolus Theophrastus Bombastus von Hohenheim. We know him as Paracelsus. And he made a famous statement, everything is a cure and everything is a poison. And the outcome you get depends on the dose that you apply. So in the internet, everything may be a cure and everything may be a poison. The question is the dosage. So stay in touch with your children, speak to them, listen to what they say, and be available to them. Ask them about what is happening. And I know they usually say everything's fine. But it is up to us as parents, as teachers, as educators uh, to try to ask another open question, trying to find out how they really are. And we should also show them the world outside or beyond the Internet. It is very easy to say, oh, young people see nothing outside the computer screen. And how about us? We often look for these wonderful things in, inside the screens. And if young people see that we are immersed in the digital world, it's a good thing to remember that we are the role model and we influence. Do not threaten them. Show them the threats uh, and teach them to think in a critical way. And most importantly, be available. Professor, in the first place, what a pleasure it is to share the stage with someone else. And there will be such nice moments when we will have speakers present physically in the studio. So the first point, uh, this is this one. And there was an, a very lively uh, discussion uh, on chat. And uh, if I were to find some common denominator, uh, I would say that you have presented this generation beautifully and most poignantly. And we educators, parents, we would like to do something effective to fend off um, cyber uh, 
uh, bullying uh, 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 and sexting and other problems that we see, what, what, what kind of a language we should apply to talk to them? Well, we should keep talking to them. This is the first point. Uh, and you should really not uh, be um, condescending like you, uh, my grandchild, you should do the following thing. No, no. A very uh, recent uh, r- test that was done or a, uh, research that was done uh, where we looked into the uh, negative contacts and uh, neg- negative contents and hate speech. Well, they, uh, a group of renowned uh, sociologists uh, put together a bot and uh, uh, if someone was uh, using hate speech, this bot would say, oh, well, I know that we may be upset at some point, but if we are kind to one another, this uh, forum will be nicer. And this pr- simple intervention uh, uh, happened uh, to reduce violence and negative comments in individual people. So this is really a very hopeful result, because if we respond, if we react, if we say that something is negative, but not in terms of penalizing, not from punitive terms, but from inviting the and encouraging positive conduct, this yields results. So talk, talk, and talk to your kids, and just don't yell at them. Stop uh, being glued to the internet, to the screen. I think that this is an excellent uh, advice and excellent uh, conclusion from this debate, and we should keep on talking talking to our children, and uh, it is not so that you have um, taught your kids one thing and you don't have to repeat. Yes, I used to study uh, Latin for three years, and I remember that uh, adage that repetitio is master studio. Uh, Repetition is something that is a source of learning. Uh, We should not be just um, preaching our children day in, day out, but we should give them hints. And this would uh, give us grounds to be hopeful. Thank you. A whole array of very useful tips uh, from you. And if I may uh, benefit from this time that we uh, spent together, one of the ladies says that people do text and they don't call one another and they don't meet uh, in the physical space. So this is like quitting life in some way. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. We forgot that the mobile phone or smartphone is not only for texting. We can call people. We can call on people to see them physically, knock at somebody's doors, have a coffee together, talk about various things, just to send this message that we are just around the corner. We are social beings. Let's stay so uh, let's continue to be social uh, uh, beings. We should have a round of applause right now, and we would have a round of applause. But um, without any further ado, let me invite the next speaker. We are talking about psychology and uh, psychology applied prophylactics, because you, Professor, you gave us a diagnosis and you switch into prophylactics prevention. And we'll speak about resilience, resilience in various contexts, resilience to digital threats. So in a moment, we'll have uh, Dr. Linda Papadopoulos uh, an expert from London. Thank you.